welcome back to the Art of Adventure. This is episode 156 with Jeremy Ryan Slate. The Art of Adventure is the podcast that helps you travel the world, run your business, and embark on an epic quest. I'm your host, lead explorer and guide, Derek Laudermilk. You can head over to the website, DerekLaudermilk.com, to check out the show notes for this episode and sign up for the monthly reading newsletter. And if you're looking to start a business, you can take anywhere in the world. You can head to my coaching page and sign up for a free 30-minute strategy session with me. In today's session, we have my friend Jeremy Ryan Slate, and he is the creator of the very successful podcast, Create Your Own Life. And he's also got some other business ventures that he's doing, PR and media for podcasters and entrepreneurs. And so we're going to take a look at how he runs some of the specifics of his business because he's a systems guy. He's very active in the networking that he does, always building new relationships and helping people out online. So we'll look at some of his mindsets and philosophy around how he builds these relationships with hard to reach, powerful, busy people quickly, how he keeps track of everything, how he, he also, we also talk about how he gets interns, how he sets that up. It's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. More of a under the hood look at a business that's really taking off. So I think you will enjoy this episode with Jeremy Ryan Slate. Here we go. Welcome back to the Art of Adventure. I'm here today with my friend Jeremy Ryan Slate. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Derek. What's up, man? I'm happy to finally be on your show. I know you uh, delivered some amazing stuff on my show a while back, man. Yeah, this, this has been a long time coming, and we were just chatting before the before the recording started about your ability to find yourself in riotous and awkward situations around the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I didn't realize you were telling me that the Peruvian government was paying people to riot. It, it's funny, man. It's like, especially in South America, a lot of the governments are like super, super like pay to play, meaning a lot of the politicians like are so corrupt that they don't really make a lot of money. So they make a lot of their money off of like corrupt deals and stuff like that. So there was this whole thing going on where a Mexican mining company was coming into uh Arequipa, Peru, which is like in central Peru, down past Cusco, where uh, where uh, Machu Picchu and all that stuff is. It's closer to the south. And the uh, government was actually paying people to act like they cared about this mine coming in, um, even though it was going to bring in more jobs and everything else. And so they were paying people to riot, and they actually had it scheduled. Like, today is the first day of the riot. Everyone will, will arrive. And it was just the first day they just kind of protested. Then it got really, really violent, and they were like um, – the streets were all like made of brick. So they were ripping up the streets. They built a wall through a lot of the streets. The police were coming in with tear gas. Um, my friend and I were actually standing on the roof of the, the hotel we were staying in, and we actually – got hit with tear gas because it came up and hit us in the face because we oh, were kind wow. of observing this whole thing. And it was it was crazy, man. Like, it got really violent really fast. You could hear, like, gunshots and, like, I don't know if it were, like, I, I don't think it was powerful enough to be a bomb or anything, but you could hear, like, kind of these, like, little explosions and stuff like that. Like, it escalated really, really quickly. And we were in Arequipa for, uh, I think, like, three or four days, like, probably probably three or four days at that point. We had spent a couple weeks there, but we were held up in this hotel for, like, Mm. three days because we were supposed to go around the city and do different things as like part of this trip we were there for. And they actually canceled all of our stuff, kept us inside. There was some concern that because a lot of the rioters started harassing local business owners that, you know, maybe they might try and like break the door in this hotel or whatever. Like, so we got pretty concerned as our group. And at night they would always kind of like slow down. Cause I guess the rioters would kind of like chill for a little bit and they actually, <laughs> Yeah, right? So they they actually um, took us out in the middle of the night um, when it was dark and everything was kind of chilled and they took a lot of back roads. And we ended up going to um, the next city that we were supposed to go into in Peru because we spent time in different cities. Like we spent um, a few weeks, most of the time we spent in Lima because it's one of the biggest cities in Peru. Um, The rest of the country is not as developed, you know, it doesn't have like any Wi-Fi or anything like that. So... um, they took us to the next city we were supposed to go to, which was in 
the south of Peru, just just on the the side of the Chilean border. Like if you mm. could go to Chile to uh, Chile in like uh, twenty minutes or something like that. Um, I, I, I'll be honest with you, man. I can't remember the name of the city, even though I spent like a week there. <laughs> um, but they took us there a day earlier, and because because it, it was interesting, because we were actually there for for Rotary International for, um, so like we as the people as part of the group, we didn't really have a lot of control over what was going on. So kind of back home, the people that were running this trip were deciding, well, do we send them to the next city early, or do we actually even bring them home? Because we were spending a month in Peru at this point. And they were considering ending our, our trip after about three weeks because they, they didn't really know what was going to happen. You know, it yeah. was kind of like a, a, a situation. And so Rotary so, is a service organization? Were you, yeah. You were down there volunteering? Yeah, this is part of like what's called a group study exchange. So we're there to kind of learn about the culture, learn about what's going on, see how mm. people need help. And then when we came back, we actually did a lot of fundraising stuff to, um, you know, help with blood banks, help with clean water, which is actually the biggest thing is there's not a lot of clean water in Peru. And a lot of it, like I said, has to do with government corruption. You know what I mean? Like they're like the Peruvian people are some of the nicest and most accepting people you can ever meet. But the government kind of has things in a really, really rough way. So, um, you know, Lima is super developed. It's really nice. There's these beautiful neighborhoods. And then you go... 10 minutes outside the city and um there was in the mid 80s there was a lot of terrorism going on in the mountains hmm. um and so a lot of these people that lived in the mountains that were poor that didn't really have anything moved into the outskirts of the city and it's kind of become like a shanty town like the streets are falling down um the buildings are falling down people are living in these little like shacks with like tarps over them and stuff like that so it's super poor and one of the big things that Rotary was actually doing is we went into these areas and a lot of the fundraising we did actually built schools and was giving these kids that would have had no shot education. Um, so one of the big things, it, it's interesting because the German Rotary, because um, there's Rotary clubs in each country, the German okay. Rotary actually had taken a large responsibility for actually putting in uh, like technical schools. So teaching kids skills, because that's one of the biggest Leave things. The is, Germans. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Germans. And they, they went in and they, would, they were teaching them, you know, how to sew, how to start a business, how to do these different things, because f especially for these people, like there's no jobs, man, in that place. So entrepreneurship and creating something is kind of your only way out. So, you know, Rotary was doing some amazing things and going in and empowering these people. Um, you know, helping give them jobs and, and clean water was huge because especially in the area, this area, you know, there wasn't always electricity, there was water, but was it clean? Was it, you know, was it not clean? So one of the big things was helping to clean water as well. It's, yeah, it, it wow. was really, it was really an interesting experience because for myself, you know, I've traveled a lot. We've been to different countries, but I've never seen poverty like that. You know, um, like, like I've, I guess I've passed it because I took the bullet train, um, from Rome to, uh, Florence when I was in Italy. And you kind of see people living in, in the countryside out there that are farmers and they have their little little huts with tarps and stuff like that. But you're not like, you know, you're, you're driving past, so you don't have to really be a part of it. And when sure. I was actually in Peru, I'm just kind of like, holy crap, man. I've never been like like in it like this. That kind of made me look at mm. what I was doing and what I had and kind of be more thankful for it. You know what I mean? That's It was the hardest thing, like especially with what we do. We're so dependent on Wi-Fi, right? Um, there would be weeks where we didn't have it. So it's kind of like... It's crazy to think that the infrastructure wow. was different. What year was this that you were there? 2015. This was last year, last, last May. Year. Wow. Okay. They don't have Wi-Fi yet. It's kind of well, they, like they, they have expect... it, but it's so spotty. It's yeah. it's super super spotty. And uh, one of the things that you actually do on this trip is um, you look at different things that have to do with like your vocation. So like internet marketing, marketing, website building. That's a lot of what I do, and and podcasting. But when I went there, there was nobody there that really did that. So, I, and I was doing some e-commerce stuff at the time as well. So they introduced me to their guy that was like their digital marketer, which they're still doing. I don't remember if you had, no, remember a few years ago here in the U.S. We had this whole thing of, you know, text blah 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 code to this number, and then they would like send you text message marketing. Yeah, that's their idea of digital marketing because that's still what they have is this text marketing because it never hasn't really advanced beyond that. So I met with this guy and I'm like, wow, man, this is like 1998. It was interesting <laughs> to me. And then the other guy I met with for vocation was actually the CEO of one of the second largest internet company in the country. And um, for this trip, he actually gave me a wireless router 
that I was able to carry with me everywhere. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I, I became very popular in this group very quickly because if, if they were next to me, they could go online. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jeremy. Um, what's going on? Just thought I'd hang out with you tonight. No reason. <laughs> But. <laughs> it's funny because they'd be standing next to you because everybody had their phone on airplane mode and they'd be on Wi-Fi. And they'd be like, is your router on? I'd be like, uh, no, I turned it off to save battery. Why? It's like, oh, I, I was wondering why it wasn't working, man. You know, I was, I was <laughs> trying to check out Facebook. Jeremy, the mobile hotspot. I love it. So this is it's a good it's good time for us to segue into what you're doing now. And this is a, a celebration is in order because you just passed 100,000 downloads of your podcast, Create Your Own Life. Congratulations. Thanks, man. I, like, it's funny because, like, I think it's definitely an achievement, but I have kind of, like, I want to be doing that in a month. Like, you know, it's, it's, I guess, the first step on getting there, right? Well, you've been doing the show less than a year, right? Yeah, About it'll a be um, a year on November 20th. And you're at a phenomenal number of episodes, 170-something? Yeah, 176 came out today. 176. And 100,000 downloads, that's, that's pretty substantial for a year effort. And this is your yeah. first podcast. Actually, it's no. my second. Oh, oh um, it's your second podcast. When I, when I was in Peru, I was like, I really want to do a podcast. So I came back. And um, at the time, I was like spending a lot of time um, in network marketing. And I wasn't like, I, I made some money. But let me tell you, man, that's no, I don't know if it's something you've ever did, but it's kind of no way to live. <laughs> Because it's it's really tough. So I was like, you know what? I will talk about my network mark and business experience in a podcast. And I didn't really have a lot of background. I didn't have a lot of skills. Um, I didn't really know how to launch a podcast or do graphic design or anything. So I like got a 30-day free trial of Photoshop and tried to make a iTunes graphic. And it looked like a third grader made it with a crayon. <laughs> and um, I had this podcast for about, like, about a month and a half, two months. Mm. And uh, I was doing episodes like... 10 minutes before they were supposed to come out on the night before. And, um, I, you know, I was very unprepared. I was relying on myself as this like expert source. And I wasn't really an expert in anything, man. I didn't have any, I don't think I've had as much business experience, as much technical experience at that point as I do now by having to like learn and try and do more things. So the information I put out, I felt like was, was crap. It wasn't very good. <laughs> and, it just it wasn't valuable to anybody. So I think the first month it had like a it had 98 downloads. I was like kind of like, it, you know, I was really rocking. I was like, wow, 98 <laughs> downloads, like 14 <laughs> downloads an episode. This is great. Um, and then month two, I think I like I hit 200, and then I was like, ah, oh, I don't really see this going anywhere. This whole podcasting thing. Like, so I so I quit. I dropped it, and that was the end of it. You know, so it was. Wow, so just... I, I'll tell you what, though, man, I learned a lot about how it works by screwing it up royally. And later on, I actually took a course by uh, Andrew Farabee, the founder of the Knowledge for Men podcast, called the Podcast Blueprint. And that actually taught me a lot of the stuff I was missing that kept me from being successful in that podcast. And I think that was the difference in in doing this show. It's interesting you mentioned uh, Farabee. I I just met him at uh, Justin Sensrum's conference, Elite Man Conference in Plymouth earlier this year. We were both speaking. He's, oh, I, I actually met him last week for the first time. He's at the, super energetic. Uh, Thri Thrive Conference, yeah. Yeah, wow. <laughs> but you have a little bit of what he has too. Like You just have all this energy that comes through on through the mic, you know? I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So we talked a little bit about you know, create your own life and how it's it's been pretty successful. Some of the other things that I've perceived – you know, as, as we've known each other for the last year, you are really good at getting press. Uh, you've taught me personally a bit about press releases, getting into traditional media. Um, you're really good at connecting with uh, and getting high level guests on the show. And you're good at just, you know, meeting the right people. And so I thought we could focus this episode around how you connect with people. Um, yeah. Do you think that so so my impression of network marketing is that it's a lot of reaching out to people. Do you think that practice in network marketing helps drive your skills in networking today? No, I, I think in all honesty, it kind of made this hurdle for myself that I had to overcome ah. um, because it, it, it changes your communication and makes it very non-genuine um, because you're like, 
you don't make any money by selling a product. You know, you don't make any money. You make money by recruiting more people that recruit more people that recruit more people. So it gets really weird, man. Like you feel like you can't have a genuine conversation anymore because you're like thinking in the back of your mind, okay, how can I get this person to do what I'm doing? So for me, that was actually, and I, I don't know if it's more of a cynical way of looking at it. It's, it's funny. I know uh, John Oliver just put out that MLM documentary recently and I, I kind of laughed my ass off at it because I came a little, I've become a little bit cynical about it. And for me, it became a little bit of a hurdle because I think it, I don't know, it made things more difficult for me. So actually like, getting away from that and starting starting a podcast for me was actually like a big first step like you've probably seen this with your own like it for me it made me have to communicate differently it made me have to be more interested in the person I was speaking to you know really genuinely want to learn about them without saying you know because that's the thing I think when with with network marketing is you're always trying to figure out what's wrong in somebody's life so you can be like hey I got this thing you could join in we're gonna make a hundred grand next month but nobody's really gonna make any money you know it's like so it <laughs> so like you kind of have to force that out of yourself and really be interested genuinely want to learn from the person and I think having a podcast at that time was great for me because it helped me to kind of be me again and kind of get mm. back to because I've always been this like very like I was always the one that teachers yelled at in school because I've always had this very inquisitive mind. I have to know how everything works. I have to know why everything works. Um, you know, my parents used to get mad at me as a kid because I used to take apart all of our appliances and put them back together. Um, <laughs> so it kind of let me, I guess, get back to that more childish side of myself. Like not childish in a bad way, but like the childlike curiosity. Yeah. Um, and be kind of be more curious and kind of learn really how things worked. And that's really, I think, what set me up to be more successful in networking because it helped me to make some mindset shifts that are like really difficult, I think, for a lot of people to make, especially when you've kind of been in a kind of place where you feel like every person I'm talking to, I need them to do what I'm doing or I'm never going to make money. You, you know what I mean? It, that, that's, it's a difficult place to be in. And it's, yeah. um, I, you know, I have some friends that have done very well with it. But for, for myself, I made some money, man. I was living off of it. But the thing was, is like, it's just other people wouldn't do what I was doing. And I also wasn't enjoying life at that point. So it was like, I, I had to do something different. Yeah. So what is your current business model? You have a lot of people becoming aware of you through your podcasting and the articles you write. What's your plan? How are you currently making money? And then where is it going to go? Well, the thing is, is like in the, in the grand scheme of things, I'm probably like 20% on the way of where I want to be. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's the thing with podcasting is a lot of people think that they're going to go in this, they're going to make a ton of money because they see, you know, what John Lee Dumas has done. And he's done some amazing things, but not everybody can be John who's doing, you know, 1.5 million downloads a month and generating six figures and everything he's doing. So the thing people have to understand is if you're going to start a podcast, it's kind of more of a labor of love at first. And it's kind of more of something that is going to help you reach more people. So for myself, I had to find an income source first because um, I was not very happy with what I was doing, you know, network marketing wise. I op also at the same time owned a in-home personal training company. So I was going into people's homes, training them. And that was another thing driving all over the place that really burnt me out. So I, I had a friend that had a marketing company that was looking to add more digital services. So I've always had a lot of skills in social media, copywriting, um, you know, WordPress development. I do HTML, CSS, CSS, all that fun stuff. So it was kind of like a really good fit for me that she brought me in and I kind of added more value to her company. But I also worked on a very like make my own schedule. You know, I was only at the office two days a week. I worked from home the other days and I was only working like maybe 20 hours a week. But it was kind of enough that I had some income that I could kind of work on this, you know, labor of love of building a podcast and not have to worry about every single action I was taking making me money. Yeah. And I think because of that, a lot of the actions I took were kind of, you know, well, how can I help the audience more? How can I create a better product? How can I create a better interview? And I think that's a lot of kind of the secret sauce behind why this was so successful because I wasn't looking at it as this thing has to make me money right now. And as we went along, I actually ended up getting some some sponsorship deals and it, it brought in some money there. So, But it still wasn't the thing I was depending on for, you know, bringing in money. And... Then once the numbers really started to blow up, I started to get people to ask me about, you know, wanting to start a podcast. 
Mm. And I, I don't I, I still haven't gotten to the point where I'm like, yeah, I'm going to make a course and I'm going to teach everybody how to podcast because I, I just I, I don't know. I don't know if that's what I want to do. Mm-hmm. But the thing I, I did want to do is you had mentioned some of the things that I do differently. Like I've re- my, my wife has a background in PR like that's that's what she went to school for. So she's kind of taught me a lot of these different skills that like people are like, oh, well, the press release is dead. Well, not really. She taught me how to, pre- how to write a press release, which, you know, I then forwarded to you. And, you know, it, it, and, and the thing is, is we got some press off those and it, it actually helped. Like it got me on TV. It did all these different things. It got me noticed more. And I noticed a lot of podcasters and a lot of people in the space weren't doing a lot of these older, more traditional marketing and PR actions. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of what made my podcast successful. So we were able to combine what we did and then offer this kind of done for you podcast model, but with all these other marketing actions and PR actions attached to it. Um, so we are, you know, we're working with business owners that want it in terms of everything a podcast can do for them, but they're busy, right? They don't want to do all the actions like the editing, the reaching out to guests, the writing of press releases, the, you know, pitching to different publications. So we use this podcast as kind of the center of a marketing vehicle to get their message out there, help them build an audience, but then also bring in all these PR actions to kind of expand what they're doing. And it's, you know, we we're working with our first two clients right now, and it's actually been pretty cool, man. Um, we've been reaching out to uh, the the main one that I've been focusing most of my energy on right now is a is a doctor that has a uh, we're putting together a health podcast, and I've reached out to some really cool health background people and we're really creating kind of a cool thing for him and it allows me to kind of have that creativity and still make money which is cool because that's something I really enjoy doing but we've also we're not in the place where we're ready to like hire people yet but there's always a solution to that Um, we went on internships.com and we got a couple interns so now I'm actually teaching them some of the skills that I've learned. So that's my exchange with them. They're learning how to do these different things, but it's also taking some responsibility off myself. And, you know, we've told them, you know, this is a a 10 week program and we're, as long as this is something that lines up with what you're doing, we're hoping to hire you in 10 weeks. And that, that kind of sets it up in a really nice way is if we do this right and we play our cards right, because the only, that's the biggest thing that I've learned in, you know, a lot of, the business experience I've had of, you know, having a personal training business, you know, having all these different businesses is my biggest crux was everything came down on me and I wasn't really able to expand. Yeah. So it was kind of like you have to get creative and and figure out different ways that you can expand Um, because I know some people use virtual assistants and that's fine. But my goal is, you know, I've I've been always been a teacher at heart. I went to school for a master's in ancient history and I taught high school for a couple of years. So I've always enjoyed that teaching portion of any endeavor. So like to be able to teach somebody that wants to maybe eventually have that type of business or work for me in the future, that kind of is cool to me. You know know what I mean? And it's also for, for me nice that they're actually here in the U.S. with me as well if I, you know, need certain things. That's something that I'm not familiar with, internship.com. I'll probably check that out. A lot of my friends in the space are always saying something like, oh, I need to get an intern. And I've, even myself, I've, you know, posted on, at the colleges that I attended and, and said like, hey, looking for interns, never had any, yeah. anyone. Well, it's, it's, if you do it on internships.com and you just write a good profile, fill everything out. And the thing is, is like, you're not just looking for somebody you can just give work to. Like, that's not the point. Like, if, if you, you want to give them some responsibility, but their goal is, because the thing is, is you always got to offer exchange of some sort. And if you're not giving them money, you have to give them training because they're, they're reaching out to you because, so like, uh, my wife has a PR aide that's an intern. She wants to eventually do PR. Yeah. So she's learning by doing it because I think that's one of the big biggest disconnects in school. I just spoke at a college on Monday And I think that's one of the biggest disconnects that I was saying to these kids is like, you know, everybody's so focused on read this, learn it, but there's never learn it and do it. Like that's the missing thing is like they they put so much significance on learning all this stuff and sometimes stuff you're never going to have to do. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like, let's say in a photography class, right? You're learning about a type of photography that hasn't been used in 100 years. Well, (laughs) it may be cool and it may be interesting, but it's not important to me learning that skill, right? It's not important to me doing it. And I think the doing this is kind of a big thing that's missing. And that's what I like about the internships is they're actually learning by a doing this because that's how I've learned. I've always learned by, 
you know, I'm a self-taught marketer. I've learned by doing different things. And like I said about the first podcast, screwing it up royally and learning different things. Is it, is it worth your time? I mean, you spend a lot of time teaching them things and then they get up to speed and then the 10 weeks is over. Uh, is it helpful for you? Well, here's the thing. It forces you to have to be better at training and okay. to actually know who's the right person. And that's why, you know, you interview them and everything else. So, like, I just started a new um, digital and uh, also editing uh, intern on Monday, actually. So I use, like, uh, you ever use a Jing video? It does, like, screen capture and it puts t- your voice in the background and you can show them doing different processes. Okay. Uh, between Monday and yesterday and about four hours of my time, he's already trained. He already knows everything how to do because he already had a background in it, but he wanted to learn some of these different things. Mm-hmm. So he's already able to do what I need him to do, and he's going to work for 10 hours a week besides doing his other job. And now I'm able to actually unload some of that production on him, and I trained him pretty quickly because it requires me to be better at training. I think a lot of business owners, the thing that the thing they don't think of is you never like write all your processes down, right? People are just like, oh, well, here, uh, edit this video for me. Okay, well, what does video editing look like for you? You know, step one, step two, step three, step four, because the way I do it and the way you do it may be different, but if I'm bringing somebody in, I want them to do it my way. Yeah. And it's about having it written up. And then the, the Jing videos, like these screen capture videos, are amazing. It's a great tool. And I know a lot of people even uses, use those for VAs as well because you can send them with your voice talking in the background a video of your computer screen, your mouse moving around and doing all these different actions. And it's, it's, it, it's about just getting better at training people, you know? Yeah. I like that. Uh, you know, if you can successfully train someone or invest in someone or a system that's going to save you time, it's, it's a good idea, obviously. But then when it comes down to it, you're like, should I spend four hours training someone or should I just knock it out in half an hour and get it done? It's tough to get over that hurdle of investing in your future time. Absolutely, man. That was one of the biggest things because the thing the thing for me that was tough is I've always been this person like nobody can do it like I am. I am the best. I am great at this. But the, the problem is is like if you think like that, eventually you're going to be doing things that your time is way more valuable than. Like, you know what I mean? Because I have the vision of the company, of the podcast, all these different things I want to do. So – you know, and that's the difference, I think, between a business owner and an entrepreneur, right? A business owner, like, is grind, 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 do it, do it, do it. And, you know, 20 years from now, they're doing the exact same thing or they're out of business. An entrepreneur is somebody that's able to, you know, they learn the skills. They know the basic skills that are going to be done in each part of their business, but they're also able to empower and train other people so that they can build it up. Yep. And I, I think that's kind of the, the big difference between those two. Yeah, and once you master a certain part of the business, then to grow, you're going to need to master entirely new skills. Right, write it up and get somebody else to do it. Yeah, so let me (laughs) ask you, what is the next skill set that you think that you need or want to learn? Honestly, I I think the skill set I need to learn is being a better manager. Like being a better, I, I've gotten pretty good at empowering people, but that's the one thing I sucked at in network marketing is I was really bad at running other people and maybe I would have been better at it if I was better at empowering other people, but I tried to do everything myself. So I think for myself, if I can learn how to be a better manager, I think that's kind of the missing element and what's going to allow me to really take my business to the level I want to take it to. Yeah, interesting. You, you know what I mean? Because like, because like, for example, like I have I've talked to different people that work for Grant Cardone, and they say he's one of the single best bosses that you can work for because he empowers you to a level that he should almost be afraid that you're going to go work for somebody else because he's given you so much skill and empowered you so much. Because he's like, you know what, man, I'll just hire somebody else. That's fine. Hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Let's talk a little bit about how you approach networking. And as I recall, when we were chatting a few weeks ago. Uh, I made the connection between you and Adam Grant, who's written Give and Take, I think it's a New York Times bestseller, about his studies in business of the success of people that give first. And then there's most people fall into the matchers category where we sort of do quid pro quo. Uh, I may be in that category. And then takers get more help. You know, they take more help than they give. And, you know, his work showed that givers come out on top generally, and you are always helpful. Um, And so maybe you could just sort of share your thoughts about how you approach networking and connecting with people. 
Well, here's a funny thought. First of all, I keep a long running Evernote document of everything I'm ever dumping out of my head and I should probably get better at organizing it. Cause I was just looking at it yesterday. And I was like, Adam Grant and the name of the book. I'm like, who told me about this? <laughs> so thanks. Thanks for reminding me that you told me about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But I think that the, the, it's funny because I think the biggest thing, first of all, is you got to understand your own basic purpose. And I, I, you know what I mean? Like, why are you, why are you here? Why are you doing like, what do you want to eventually do? Because I think a lot of times we tend to get this like shiny object syndrome and we run yeah. back and forth to every little thing that we think could make us money. And it's probably off purpose for us. So that's kind of like the first thing you have to have in your mind, you know, is this idea of having purpose. And I think the second thing is like the kind of person you have to be. Right. And I think that was the, the mindset shift I talked about before that I don't think a lot of people can make. I think it's really difficult because a lot of people have this mindset of you need to give me, you need to help me, you need to do this, you need to blah, 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 blah. And they're depending on other people to help them survive because they're so afraid that if you don't help them, they're going to die and they're going to lose their business or whatever. You know what I mean? They're this, it's just at this this really like needy level. And it, it, it's really interesting that it's when you kind of make that shift to be like a more valuable person, right? Because they're like, you know, I'm broke, I need help. Okay, well, here's the thing. Like I, I wrote an article for Influensive not too long ago about this. Here's the thing. Even if you have money, you always have something, right? You have time, you have skills, you have something. And I, I think that's the thing people have to understand is everything is always a value exchange, right? You can't just think people are just going to give you stuff. It just doesn't work like that. And I, and I think once you kind of make this idea of becoming a person of value, like, you know, um, okay, I don't have any money, but I can connect two people that I think would be really, really cool together. And it's not a, it's, it, it, I think it, it's funny because I just, I, I was at a conference recently and I heard um, Lewis Howes and a couple different people talking about this is they'll like do certain things like, for example, with a book launch, he'll do certain things because he wants to receive things. And I think that's kind of a little bit of a jaded viewpoint. Um, you know, I give because I want to see other people do well. You know what I mean? And, and I think that's the thing people have to understand is you're not giving something to somebody because you want something. And, and it's, it's this idea of, you know, I really like what Derek's doing in The Art of Adventure. And he says, I'm looking to get more press and whatever. Oh, let me give him this press release because I think that'd be cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then it kind of makes me more valuable to you. And I'm not really doing it because I'm looking for anything. I just I do it because I admire what you're doing. I think it's cool. I think, you know, the angle that you come at it from is really cool. And I think that's kind of the viewpoint you have to have is this whole idea of wanting to see other people do well and them doing well doesn't threaten your success. You know what I mean? Because people think that, well, if this person does well, then I have to do even better. Well, it's, it's kind of this idea that let's, let's look at it for podcasting, for example, right? If I help you, if I help another person, if I help another person, a rising tide lifts all ships. And if podcasting does better, we all do better, right? We all do great. And I think that's what people really have a really hard time with because yeah. they think everybody is their either their competitor or their enemy or whatever. And it's kind of that mindset shift you have to make. I was I was just thinking about this and tell me tell me what you think. Yeah, uh, we are a tribal people, so evolved in small groups and so there would be a hierarchy in a small group and so you would be uh, a rising tide wouldn't lift all boats it'd sort of be like you know each person would have their place but mm -hmm. now we're much bigger as a species than hierarchical mm -hmm. and so i think our maybe our evolution hasn't caught up with our thinking or our thinking hasn't caught up with where we are Mm -hmm. um, because it's, it's, I think hardwired into us to, to not innately know that a rising tide would lift all boats. Mm -hmm. How did you come to believe that, to actually internalize that for yourself? Yeah, it kind of goes back to what I said before about like, you know, I started a podcast as more of a labor of love is more something I really wanted to do. And I had income coming in from another place of working from somebody mm -hmm. because I think a lot of times, especially with new entrepreneurs, people don't have a money source and it scares the crap out of them. And it should man. It's your livelihood. But it's you need some sort of an income source somewhere to really like make that mindset shift, because when it comes down to survival, you're looking to everybody else for your survival. You know what I mean? And and I, I think for me, that's what allowed me to do it is um I have something that's a pretty stable income source. It's not big, but it's enough, you know, and it was it was something that at the time 
allowed me to focus on that more from a viewpoint of giving. And it's funny because I found out that focusing from that viewpoint of giving actually, you know, helped me to receive pretty quickly. You know, I became a contributor in different publications. Um, I was featured in different places. So it, it's like the, the more the more you give, the more you receive. And I find that it's it, I feel like it's kind of this idea that at some point the universe is trying to balance out the exchange that you keep putting out there as long as it's good stuff, you know, and, and, and I think that's something a lot of people struggle with. Yeah. Um, you were telling me about uh, this press release company that you just uh, tested out to yeah. get your thing. Um, your, I guess you were talking about the 100,000 download mark. Yeah. Press release. Um, yeah, maybe you could talk about some of the ways, like how you got on TV, how you use press releases, um, and if it's worth doing for people or not. Yeah, I, I definitely think it is, man. Because like... Um, First of all, my wife writes them for me because um, I it's I'm, I'm a literary writer and a press release is like it's almost like a Tarantino movie. You write it backwards. <laughs> but um, so, so the thing is, but then knowing where to submit them. So like um, local publications are always easiest. So like, um, you know, I go to the local newspaper that comes in the mail. I go to the local subscription newspaper. But then I made a step up and I. Here in New Jersey, one of the bigger regional papers that has a pretty good readership is called the Bergen Record. Um, and NJ.com is the bigger company that owns the Bergen Record. So I submitted a release to there. It's about dealing with some of these smaller publica publications. I, I, I got kind of lofty and I submitted to NPR. I never heard anything, but I tried. <laughs> um, so, but it's like kind of starting there and you, you, you'll find out some interesting stuff. So like the, the Bergen Record picked up the release then a TV producer reads the Bergen record and was like, wow, podcasts are hot right now. And I don't really know anything about them. Let's have this guy on TV. Mm. So then I got a call from a television channel and I was featured on TV talking about like podcasts. And they, you know, they came to my home and took pictures of me doing podcasts and stuff like that. So it's it, you got to continually put yourself out there. These opportunities don't happen. And I've never we've never explored the idea of a paid press release before. So um, there was this website. Uh, 24-7 pressrelease.com. I did some research and I was looking at all different ones because some of them are expensive, some of them don't have as much reach. Um, and like their second level package, um, like their second highest package was like 139 bucks or something like that. And uh, it didn't include like uh, Yahoo, AOL, and MSNBC Money as like the places where releases went. But in, in my mind, it's kind of like I'm not going to pay an extra 200 bucks just for those. It's kind of like whatever. Um, but that that package did go. To, it went to like three thousand different press outlets. It went to the Associated Press. It went to uh, you can you can pick like ten different um, like focus like focus industries. So it went to ten different focus industry industry publications. So maybe at some point a magazine can pick it up. So in the first day, it got picked up by two hundred and seven different publications. And the the thing that they explain to you is, you know, keep an eye on these stats for like three weeks because you may see, you know, maybe a magazine picks it up or maybe a television channel picks it up. So I'm, you know, I'm kind of gleefully watching my email and hoping uh, something else happens. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And so with 207, it's got picked up 207 places. What do you expect will be the ROI for you? Like where where will it end up benefiting you the most, do you think? You know, I, I don't really look at it in terms of ROI, and it goes back to the strategy I have be behind writing articles. Um, you know, Grant Cardone talks about one of your biggest enemies out there is obscurity. Mm -hmm. And the idea is I'm trying to continually introduce myself to new people all the time and find out what's needed and wanted from them so I can deliver it. So if I'm not continually introducing myself to new people, and, and that's what I look at the press release a as, is I'm, um, you know, introducing myself to new people and giving myself the opportunity to introduce myself to new people. So, so that's kind of the thought process behind it. And it, it, if it builds the brand, then, then the ROI is there, but it's not mm -hmm. really, I'm not really doing it with the thought of ROI. I'm doing it with the thought of, I need to be introducing myself to every single person on planet earth because then I'll be doing pretty well. Yeah. And that's the, the main problem that we all have on the internet is here's we the think, stuff that I do. Tiny. Now I just need to tell people, and so that the right people find me. Yeah. Okay. All right. We, we just think too tiny, man. And I think it's just you got to think huge. You probably have a lot of, because you're introducing yourself to so many people, a lot of contacts. And you were talking earlier about just dumping your brain into an Evernote file. What do you do? How do you keep track of 
the people you meet and the connections and like if they've done something for you or you've done something for them or reminders, how do you, what's your system for all that? Um, well, I don't keep track of what I've done for anybody, what they've done for anybody or what they've done for me. Cause I feel like that's more like keeping a scorecard, you know, it's just kind of like I do good things. Eventually good things happen for me, but I do keep track of all the people I met mm-hmm. in a enormous Google drive spreadsheet. Um, I've kind of moved my entire life over to Google drive so I can have access to it from anywhere. Um, so I keep track of names, email addresses. Um, I don't really keep track of how we met cause I've, I've always, my memory has always been my biggest asset is, um, you know, I've, I, I can remember people I face him by name, but that was one of the, I, I managed the gym for eight years and, um, it always surprised the hell out of people that I'd greet every person by name and they'd be like, how the heck you remember my name? I don't know. It's just, yeah, a, just wow. a skill, just a skill that I have. Um, so it's just, you know, I've always been really good at making people feel important by remembering their name. So for me, like that's never really been a problem. And like, I guess that's why I was a history major. Um, but <laughs> so I, so I just keep track of, you know, names, phone numbers and email addresses. And that's pretty much it. And this like giant rolling spreadsheet um at some point it's probably gonna have to get better organized because it's unless you're using a search function it can be a little hard to find things yeah interesting you know there is uh, in st louis they just published in st louis magazine or something the hundred most influential people or something like that and i was like oh cool i'll just try to connect with all of them because they nicely published this list for me you know but then i have this list of other people like podcasters to connect with and then so it's just it ends up being this huge sort of web of people and I'm still searching for the best solution to keeping it in you know, understandable format mm. for how, how everyone is, uh, is all connected. And, you know, because what's funny is you, you go on Facebook, right? And it says friends in common or, or LinkedIn and you're two steps away from someone. Those are, those are really interesting when you start seeing like how groups of people cluster together yeah. That you might not have thought about before. And, you know, we probably have friends in common from lots of different groups as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And and have you have you reached out to any of the people on the list yet? I haven't, but I'm gonna start with one of them who I think is the the father of one of the kids I was in elementary school with. So. Okay. <laughs> so you so you have kind of a reality point with them, like something in common, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here, so this is an interesting thing because I've never done this before. I I don't even know why I, you know, it's not like I can see a clear benefit for either of us, but it just seems like a good exercise to do. How would you approach, you know, if you were going to do that, try to connect with a list of influencers, how would you go about that? Um, I am the world's biggest Facebook voyeur. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I send out a lot of friend requests and stuff like that. And, uh that's kind of the way that I'm able to do it. And then I just kind of interact with their stuff and it gradually generates some affinity. And that's kind of been how, like when I eventually meet somebody somewhere, you're able to have like, feel like you have more of a relationship. Yeah. Um, you know, be careful about how many friend requests you send out though, because if you have too many out there pending, Facebook will think that you uh, are adding people you don't know, which in this case I am. Yeah. Uh, um, and <laughs> and they, hit, they hit you with strike one. And if you get three strikes, they take down your account. So uh, mm. what, what, what I usually do is if I send out a friend request, um, you're, you're able to view your sent requests on Facebook. Um, so if I send out, I don't usually like to have more than 10 pending at a time. Um, because if you have too many pending, then like I said, they hit you one of those strikes and I have two against me right now. So I don't want that third one. Um, so I kind of look at which ones have been sitting for a while and I'll just cancel the request. And, you know, eventually an opportunity comes up where you cross with that person again and I'll send that a friend request again. And they usually accept it at some point. So it's just kind of like constantly putting yourself out there. And I kind of use Facebook as this tool to get to know people as, as real people because, then once you it, like, you know what I mean? I think a lot of people like sit in this online space and live in it. I just kind of use it as a tool to like make real genuine relationships offline because you kind of learn more about the person as a human being. And I think we've lost that in social media. Yeah, that's great. And and it sounds like you go to enough conferences, events and whatnot that you can actually close the loop in real life. Yeah, and and you gotta like really like people. Like I, I I really genuinely just like people, and I like laughing, and I like hanging out, and I like talking. So you know that that's that's a great skill to have in that way, I guess. Yeah. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about yet that you want to make sure we talk about? 
Um, not really, man. I feel like I feel like I kind of like gave you a lot of good stuff. <laughs> Unless there's anything else you want to cover. No, this is good. This is good. It's been a nice free flowing conversation. And... Yeah, I like your interview style. It's fun. <laughs> I'm just curious about all these things that you're doing, so I'm just I'm just asking you. Okay, so I've got two questions that I ask all of my guests. Okay. First one is, if you could change or add anything to the world, what would you want the world to have? I think I would change people's money thinking um, because it, it's. I think this was hard for me as I was raised in a very religious family where we're told you know money's bad and blah 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 blah. And it's not really that. Like one of my favorite books is Atlas Shrugged, and um, the uh, character that Ayn Rand has in that book, uh, Francisco de Anconia, says that it's not money that's the root of all evil, but it's love of money that it's the root of all evil. You know, money is just an energy unit, and I think people have to understand that it allows you to do more and give more. And once you kind of get over that and and learn that money isn't a bad thing, you know, that's kind of when you get to that next level of doing things and helping people. So if, if there was one thing I could do with the world, I think I would change people's money consciousness and their, their money thinking. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that. We, um, my, my friend and I, Nick Wood, who's host of Life Athletics podcast, when he came on my show, he talked about global goals and mm. creating, you know, because we have resources on the planet to be able to solve most of our biggest problems already, but we're just not mobilizing ourselves well enough. And so I've been asking people at the end of each episode this question, and I realized we have all this data now on what people want to see in the world. And, you know, yours yours is actually pretty unique in terms of the ones I've looked at so far. Um, there is a lot of mindset shift related things. Um but no one's no one's really touched on money yet. So, well, because I, I think there's like for some reason there's just this weird taboo about it. You know, like um, there's that quote in the Bible where they say that uh, you know, a, a rich man can't pass through the eye of a needle to get into heaven. And it's kind of like it's the way you use it. You know what I mean? It's what you do with it. Like when you're on an airplane, what do they tell you? Put the the mask on yourself before your child next to you. And if you if you are if you're not in a place where you can think more abundantly and you know have something to actually give people monetarily then you're not really any any good to empower other people and help them right it's it's just it's just changing your money thinking man it's just it's not a bad thing Hmm. yeah second question is what's your definition of adventure adventure for me it's funny because i feel like i feel like i'm more of the adventurer type than you would think uh adventurer for me is doing things that absolutely scare the hell out of me because then that causes me to grow more as a human being and have to be better than the person I was yesterday. Um, you know, for, I sold life insurance for a while. I hated making phone calls. You know what? It got me over that and it got me over a lot of different things. Podcasting. I was scared to talk to people because I told you because of some of the experiences I had before. It got me back in this place where I love talking to people and I love communicating again. So for me, adventure is, is taking big risks, man, and, and having fun. Um, you know, we got engaged in 2013 in Greece at the time when there was these, quote, riots going on. There was probably this, like, one block where this one guy was standing with, like, a something on fire and the rest of the city was fine. So I think <laughs> it's kind of taking these risks where you never have these great, amazing experiences and become the better person you could be. Love it. That's awesome. Yeah, and I can definitely tell through your experience of calling people, you know, that you're not comfortable with. It's it's definitely shows through now in your conversational style. It's nice and free and easy. Yeah, because it's it's like and as I said, if I didn't I don't know, if I didn't have a podcast, I don't think I would have ever gotten back to that place. It kind of it kind of really helped me in that way. Yeah. Jeremy, what's the best place for people to find you online? Uh, best place is over at jeremyryanslate.com, and everything I do is linked up right over there, and and, and also any resources or anything people are looking for. I have uh, I've mentioned a bunch of tools on this episode. Yeah. I actually have if uh, they put in their email address, I have a list of the top five tools that I use every single day in my business, and and also a description of how I use them. Brilliant. Well, Jeremy, thanks so much for coming on the show. I'm glad we made this happen, and it's always good to chat with you. So really appreciate it. Yeah, Derek, thanks for having me, man. This has been an awesome experience. I got to talk about a lot of different things that I never talked about. The, the Peru experience I've never talked about anywhere before. Um, so that was really cool. Awesome. We will be in touch. Talk again soon. Cool. So long. All right. Hope you enjoyed that episode with Jeremy 
Slate, really nice guy. Awesome, awesome person to know. Lots of advice. He's always dishing out. He's probably helped me more than I've helped him. I should, <laughs> I should do him some favor. Uh, I'm glad he was on the show. What, uh, what did you learn from this episode? Do you want an intern? Do you want to be an intern? Do you want to be an intern for the Art of Adventure? Send me an email. How about that? Just opportunities happening just like that. Uh, Derek at DerekLettermilk.com. That's my email. And what is your biggest takeaway from this episode? I'd love to hear your feedback and your thoughts of what you learned from this episode. And if you leave those thoughts as a comment in iTunes for this podcast, you will be entered to win uh, our monthly drawing for a lifetime membership in the adventurous entrepreneurship community, which is normally $600 a year. Bada bing, bada boom. And uh, if you want to start a business, uh, you can still email me at Derek at DerekLettermilk.com. That's my email. And you can sign up for a free 30-minute strategy session with me. That's all for today's episode. Now it's your turn to go out there and be adventurous. Adventurous.